Hello. So I want to mention some nonfiction books that you should probably be reading or that I would consider are like must reads for nonfiction addicts. Now, you could read these books just to be like a snobby elitist. There definitely are some people who will go and read these books just to like preach that they read them and like seem superior. But I think you should read these books, however, because there are ideas that get passed on through generations of nonfiction readers that um, if you don't if you don't read these old books, then you might not see the continuation of uh, the ideas. And a lot of the times these ideas will get passed on between different fields. Uh, I think The Origins of the Species is a great example of a book that borrowed from ideas inside economics, but that's not what this video is about. Here are some of these books that I'm talking about. It is these five books. Yeah, that's five. One, two, three, four, five. The first book is Charles Darwin's Origins of the Species. Um, this book is on here because hmm, the ideas inside this book you can probably get from a modern biology textbook and be up to date on things, right? Like I, natural selection, adaptation, variation, right? The, hmm, in terms of biological significance, the, the ideas in this book were like uh, the idea that there's a common descent between ancestors uh, or I don't know, that there's, there's a mechanism for evolution and the mechanism he argues for is natural selection. Uh, I think there are more up-to-date takes in this as well. I think gene selectionism is probably a more up-to-date take. But So there's those ideas inside this book, which would be cool to see, like the rudiments of biology in this book. But another reason why this book is important is because it was written in the context of uh, religion. And Darwin himself was even considering what it means to say that there's a common descent of man, that man descended from some kind of other animal. And so... This, these ideas actually fueled a lot of different fields inside psychology, uh, even sociology. And as a result, you kind of saw a spreading of, of nonfiction ideas from biology into other areas, which if you read this book, you will see that, right? Uh, I'm thinking in particular of sociobiology uh, uses a lot of Darwin's ideas and evolutionary psychology uses a lot of Darwin's ideas. Yeah, so I would say Origins of the Species is worth reading, especially because even the uh, nuances inside that book are misunderstood quite regularly by uh, people who do understand or haven't read Darwin himself. Um, the next one is What is Life by Schrodin Schrodinger. And uh, <clears throat> I was torn on putting this book in here because it's nothing new if you've studied biochemistry, but I guess historically speaking, this book is important because he had the ideas for biochemistry uh, or at least the philosophy for biochemistry, far before biochemistry became like a mature field. So the idea inside this book is uh, to take the, the simple, the, the reductive thinking of physics and apply it to biology. And so, for example, that organisms maintain entropy, uh, sorry, they resist entropy and they maintain order. Um, there must be some kind of me mechanics that uh, allow them to do that. Um, there's genetic codes that give the, the quote-unquote blueprints for uh, organisms. That, that idea is in here. Um, even to some extent arguing for the behavior of... Uh, it's a, I think he talks about Brownian motion, right? And how Brownian motion might contribute to the mutation of the organism because it seems to be a little bit chaotic and random. And so that might uh, there might be some kind of incentive for organisms to have randomness in their design. Basically, this book is kind of predating biochemistry. That's what it's argued for. And a lot of people say that it's a historically important book. But um, I don't know if you're going to get a lot of great ideas from this book since you have probably have studied biochemistry. That being said, you can definitely see the reductivist physics thinking um, traced back to this uh, book. You can see it traced back to his era. And you get to see that continuation of physics stepping into biology and as a result giving rise to biochemistry. Now this next one I've talked about before and I will continue to talk about for the rest of my life is IP Pavlov's Selected Works. And I say this because um, I studied psychology, I think first was like my, it was probably like my first introduction to read. philosophy and psychology were my biggest introductions into reading. And so I've heard a lot of things about behaviorism and Actually hearing what Pavlov has to say about psychology and behaviorism just tells me that people, it, it, it just, it's an <laughs> emblematic of the importance of reading primary sources because everybody gets them wrong. So 
I mean, on the one hand, it's cool to see the conditioning experiments being discussed by Pavlov himself and what applications they have. But then there's some interesting stuff towards like the second half of the book that I thought was really cool, where he talks about, for example, um, he was invited to these different psychology schools that were called behaviorists at the time. And he went and gave his opinion on them. Uh, he, for example, said that uh, he doesn't see a need for these schools or these types of thinking and that applied physiology should just be replacing all of psychology, including the behaviorists. He even said that the behaviorists would routinely bastardize his method um, for reasons to do with experiments because Pavlov was very much into controlling experiments and uh, eliminating stimulus or stimuli that could be uh, co-occurring with the target stimulus. So like he has this famous, um, I don't know if it's famous, but I remember distinctly him talking about how he wanted to soundproof his room. And so, so cars going, maybe not cars, but church bells outside weren't making noises to obviously interfere with the um, conditioning. Yeah, there's a lot of things in here that he says himself that a lot of psychology textbooks or psychologists would uh, say otherwise. You're always taught that Pavlov is like the founding father of behaviorism, but Pavlov himself thinks that psychology as a field shouldn't even exist. Uh, but at any rate, you could see how this notion of applied physiology continued on to psychology. And now there are some more physiologically oriented fields in psychology, uh, behaviorism being one of them. I think the gest gestalt psychology also being another one, uh, neuropsychology. You can see its continuation into psychology from this, from this writing. Now this next book is Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. It's a little bit less of an academic book, but the reason why I put it in here is because I think it has a good job of showing you the <clears throat> mindset of the early Americans, I guess you could say, and you wouldn't understand that unless you were reading uh, something like this. Now, I will say his autobiography is too favorable towards him, but you can see, for example, like, like one of the things that he's really big on is saving your money. Yeah, like is any money you get, save it, save it, save it, save it, save it. And that's kind of like a cornerstone of like American personal finance, like th in terms of thinking. Uh, they tell you as early as like 17 or 18, that you should start saving and start saving. Uh, you should have a savings so you can retire. Uh, funnily enough, Benjamin Franklin lost a lot of his money due to not saving <laughs> twice, I believe it was. Uh, also, his like his his uh, self help philosophy, uh, like doing it yourself, being self reliant. Uh, Emerson has the same kind of ideas. A lot of this um, self help thinking that you see today in America can be noted at least in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. And it's very interesting to see the, con the continuation of these ideas from generation to generation. And I think you can actually, there's another book that I don't have that I will get. And um, it's called Self Help. And I believe it's by a guy named Smi something Smile. And uh, he's considered like the originator of these um, kind of borderline stoic, self-reliant, self-help ideas. He called it like the Victorian mindset, I believe. Uh, but th th that mindset is also, you could see it in Benjamin Franklin. And then this last one is Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. And this book is important for a lot of reasons. And there's a lot of stuff in here that you actually don't need. So I'd say a lot of the stuff in here doesn't hold up weight to like modern empirical economics. This holds true for pretty much all old economic writing. But obviously people still debate his ideas. So for, for instance, the invisible hand is a widely debated idea, the idea that people follow their own self-interest. And if there is a given incentive for somebody to do behavior X, then behavior X will come to dominate the marketplace. Uh, people just follow incentives and incentives shape societies and economics, right? Um, also like labor theory of value, there's a couple of labor theories of values actually in this book. And he, do he doesn't, intentionally make a couple, but he words it differently every time he brings it up. And as a result, uh, there are different interpretations about what he means by labor theory of value. One's called the command theory of value. And then one's called the, I believe the labor, like just the, the, the classical labor theory of value. Um, yeah. And then obviously his laissez-faire kind of 
economic, economic thinking that has carried all the way into modern economics. Uh, people still think that that is the greatest idea. People still tell Adam Smith as being like the, <laughs> the greatest thinker when it comes to laissez faire economics. I think if you're going to study economics, you're going to have to read uh, Smith, Marx, um, also the, the Treatise on Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. Not because these ideas are necessarily true or good, but it's good to see the primary sources and to see what they actually said and then see how people have continued their ideas. Because a lot of people have continued Adam Smith's ideas. So those are five nonfiction books that I think are historically important. Again, they might not be the most up-to-date information that you're going to get. They might not even be accurate books. But if you want to see the continuation of ideas through generations by actually reading the primary sources and not just reading like a secondary history book, which I really do recommend reading the primary sources. A lot of people get the primary sources wrong. Um, then you should be reading these, these uh Nonfiction books, right? If, if you're only interested in like seeing the ideas, it's also cool to just to read old literature, right? The writing style is a bit more fancy. <laughs> but with that being said, bye bye. <laughs>